notified slums, and we're going to talk about what that actually means. But the first thing that I want to give you guys some context. Who in Mumbai is living in a non-notified slum, a slum that's not recognized by the government? What kind of water access do you have? The second piece that I want to do is then introduce this concept of human right to water, and think about that both under international law and then under Indian law. Perhaps this is an idea that you've heard about in the last decade or so, this idea of water as a human right has gained greater salience internationally uh, and also in India. And then finally, in the last part of my talk, what I want to do is actually try to connect the two and consider what are really the legal barriers to realizing the human right to water in these non-notified slums. And in doing so, I want to make an actual pretty modest proposal. When we're talking about human rights, we're going to be identifying a whole host of criteria about saying that this is a vital resource that everyone should have access to in sufficient amounts and of good quality. But in many ways, the challenges that we're going to be focused on tonight are not ones that involve really economics as much as really just legal barriers. The ways in which current laws are being interpreted. And my somewhat modest proposal is this. Can we, by framing water as a human right, actually think about separating the provision of this basic service from much thornier questions around land tenure and land security that I know Professor Weinstein is going to be talking more about. Because questions of who gets to live where and whether that's legal or not, those are really, really difficult questions. And in many ways, the question that I'm asking is, do we need to hold up the provision of a basic service like water while we wait for the outcome of these much more difficult, thornier questions? So that's the basic question that I want to ground my talk around. So getting started, let's orient ourselves. India, the subcontinent of India, it's a large country. I'm going to be focusing here on the western city of Mumbai in the state of Maharashtra. It's akin to commercial center of India, akin to perhaps the New York. Um, it's on a peninsula. So when we think about people coming to the mega city, uh, to the commercial area, the reality is that people don't have a lot of space uh, to live there because it's a long peninsula. And so you can't have the same kind of suburban expansion you might in other parts of the world. Now this is a map that was prepared by P.K. Das, uh, an architect and social activist in Mumbai. And one of the things that he identified is he mapped where all the slums are. You can't really see these statistics here. But essentially, the slums, uh, based on his count, are at 8.75% of the land. Now, if you can read this statistic over here, you'll see that 52.5% of the population, over half of the population of Mumbai, is living on just over 8% of the land. And when we think about how many people this is, we're talking about, and these are probably low estimates, around 6 million slum dwellers. So the population of Mumbai, around 12 million, of greater Mumbai, maybe closer to 18 million. So does anybody know how big is Boston? What's the population of Boston? 600,000. Yeah, 600,000. So approximately 10 times the, the, the amount of people living in Boston, 10 times that number, are just slum dwellers living in Mumbai. And there's probably another million or so pavement dwellers. And so together, they're almost making up the population of New York City, which is a little over 8 million people. This is a lot of people. But not all slums are equal. And what I want to focus my talk on tonight is the almost half of the slums are what we consider non-notified. Now later on, we're going to actually try to understand legally what does it mean to be non-notified. But for right now, essentially the basic definition is you don't have any status. There are slums that, yes, they're slums, but they actually have some kind of legal status under the law. I'm going to be focusing on the ones that are even more marginal. 
Now, I became interested in this topic because there is a, a uh, research organization called PUKAR, based in Mumbai, that has an interesting model of both collaborating with academic institutions, but they work with grassroots, barefoot researchers, as they call them, youth from the slums, to actually carry out surveys and do work. And they started a project called uh, Healthy Cities, Wealthy Cities. And they were focusing on this one slum. Now, I don't know if you, this is a, a image from one of the papers that their researchers collaborated on. But what do you think that is? What does that look like? It's a wharf, essentially a port. Okay, there, there are uh, almost 12,000 people, probably more, living on a wharf, okay? These are some images I was there this past spring. These are some images that you'll see from being from the ground, right? These are people who there's, um, they're right on the coast. You can see how close people have built up to the edge. And the other thing that is that this has, this slum has actually been there for a long time. Because that's actually a ship back there. And the, uh, historically, workers were brought there and encouraged to live there because they were the people who were breaking down ships. And basically, in order so that they could have a supply of workers at all time, people began living there. And that's actually how this settlement arose. Now, since we're also talking about environmental justice, it's also worth saying that it should come as no surprise to you that when we're thinking about the impacts of climate change, thinking about the role that the rise in sea levels are going to have, people who are going to be the most susceptible to extreme weather events, these are people who are living in places like Kawabunda, where they're very close to uh, they're very close to the coastline. So this is just uh, an image, a graph from the recent IPCC report that's showing the rise uh, in sea level change. And so we need to be thinking about these people not only in terms of their lack of access to basic services, but also the vulnerable places that they're living. So this group, Kukar, um, with some researchers, uh, published some great work, and one of them they looked at the health and social implications of being a non-notified slum. And this is just an excerpt from one of the tables. And one of the things to point out is when I said not all slums are created equal. What do I mean? So this column here, Mumbai slums, is from a national health census report. Uh, and it's a household survey census report, excuse me. And you can see that according to official statistics, even though people are living in slums, they have access to some kind of pipe drinking water. It may not be a pipe in your home, it may be a household tap, but they have access to some kind of pipe drinking water. And access to at least a quarter of them, or 20% approximately, have access to some kind of toilet facility. So that's not a great statistic, but when you compare it to the statistics for Calabunga, the non-notified slum. 0.1% of people have access to pipe drinking water. 10 to 12,000 people. And we can say, well then, how is it that people are living? I mean, clearly water is one of those things that's necessary for survival, it's necessary for life. How are people surviving without access to pipe drinking water? Well, the reality is that people are resourceful. And there's actually these fire brigade uh, pipes that run very close to Kalabunda. So people have discovered a way to tap into those pipes, and there's an informal network of pipes. So that's actually a picture from running in one of the, you can see these PVC pipes essentially just snaking between the household. That's how people in this community are gaining access to water. They've managed to develop their own informal water system. But then you can imagine that these are also uh, pipes that are susceptible to all kinds of diseases and uh, various kinds of microbes could be entering into these pipes because they're running alongside. And so this is an image that I took standing on the edge of Kalabunga. This is low tide, so you can see all of the trash that's accumulated there. And this is clearly also where, when you're wondering, well, where are also people going to the restroom? Well, uh, 
For the most part, people are often defecating in this very area, especially in low tide. So serious, serious health concerns. And so um, that same article has this a great shot of these uh, young women pushing a barrel down because when the water supply stops, because every once in a while, for either because of a crackdown from the officials or for some other reason, the informal system breaks down. And people drop what they're doing. And they try to scramble and figure out, OK, where are we going to get the water from? And so you see these barrels uh, all over the slum where people are storing water and ensuring that in an emergency, they have some access. Um, this is a, an image not from Call of Mother, but just from when I was in Mumbai and happened upon some people who uh, were doing some interesting things. They uncovered a manhole, but they were essentially, I mean, this is essentially what is happening, right? Where people don't have, people are willing, in many instances, to pay for and buy water because they're often buying water from tanker trucks, which is incredibly expensive, uh, paying more than you would pay if you're getting water from a pipe. But that, you know, in the absence of that, people are resourceful. In this case, uh, broke into an actual main, and I saw people using buckets pulling water out of this. So this is the scenario in Kaulabandar that is probably representative of other non-notified slums in Mumbai, where you have people living in conditions that are really tough. Now, one thing that, that I think uh, perhaps Professor Weinstein will talk more about is that you know we think of slums as, well, these are, of course, just the poorest of the poor. In fact, in Mumbai, that's not true. Because if you remember the geography of the city and the fact that it is this peninsula, it takes hours by train to commute from, from uh, sort of the suburban areas. And a lot of people, middle class people, may even be living in what are considered slums simply because they are closer to their place of work. And so not all slums, that word perhaps is, is even a misnomer when you consider, when you look at some of these structures. But in um, the, the kind of access that people have in Kalamander stands in sharp contrast to this idea of water as a human right. And so I want to talk about what that means under international law. Okay, so I'm going to come back afterwards and then trying to link the two. But I now want to take a step away from India and think about this at the international level. So water as a human right. This is now something that within international communities people say, yes, there's a legal basis for water as a human right. Let's do a really quick one-on-one -on -one of human rights law. So the founding of the human rights system in the wake of World War II, the atrocities of the Holocaust, the world said no more. And the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted. A couple of decades later, we had two seminal covenants adopted, one on the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and the other on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Now, for those of us who grew up in the US, this second covenant may seem strange. How is it that you would have social and cultural rights, perhaps in our recent healthcare debate, you hear people talking about healthcare as a human right. But that kind of language doesn't really resonate with, uh, uh, in the US discourse, in large part because the US never signed on to or ratified this covenant. And so in the US, when we think about human rights, we're almost, for, uh, for the most part, thinking about civil and political rights, i.e. the right to be free from detention, the right not to be arbitrarily detained, not thinking about rights like that are listed in this covenant, but if you might go to other parts of the world, South Africa, India, other places that have constitutions that will expressly recognize social and economic rights. So, like the right to work, the right to organize, the right to social security, the right to an education. These are all explicitly recognized in the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Uh, the right to cultural expression, the right to healthcare, the right to an adequate standard of living, which includes both uh, the right to housing as well as the right to food. Nowhere was water mentioned. It's not until 2002 when a committee 
that is through the UN body that is charged with providing legal interpretations of this covenant actually said the right to water is so intricately related to the right to health and the right to an adequate standard of living that the right to water must be part of that as well. And so there's some speculation as to why is it that, how could it be that something is so fundamental as water was not included in this covenant when these other things are expressly enumerated? Well, it might be perhaps that water was so obvious, just like air, uh, for example, is not included, but if air pollution becomes a serious issue, maybe we'll see be seeing a right to air at some point uh, coming in the future. Uh, and it may also be that, frankly, people now realize that water is not an infinite resource and that there's growing concern about water scarcity and the way it's being managed, that in some ways it is not surprising that it was not until 2002 that water finally is recognized as a right within the context of this covenant. And so this is just uh, to reaffirm what I said, that it's essentially read, so if you were to talk to an international human rights lawyer, they would say the basis for this right is basically one that sort of has a series of different groundings. One is, through this comment, we could say it's got its, it's related to the adequate standard of living and the right to health. But that, that wasn't the only thing. There was actually a right to water, and in some cases sanitation, for particular groups of vulnerable populations, specifically women. So the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, because obviously, Women are often bearing the burden of lack of access to good water in terms of gaining it. And for children as well, because when um, you think about incidents of diarrheal disease, who is really bearing the tremendous burden of lack of access to clean, safe water? It's young children. In addition, in 2010, the UN General Assembly considers a resolution and adopts a resolution recognizing water as a human right. And then a couple of months later, uh, the Human Rights Council also, by consensus, puts uh, a stamp of approval on this. And if you look, you can't really look at these, the, the names of the countries there are a little bit small, but you can see that India is among the countries that is voting in favor of the right. Um, perhaps in the Q&A we can talk about why some of the other countries were uh, abstaining, including the country we're in right now, the United States. Um, but the legal basis essentially is grounded in this, this comment 15 based on the covenant, um, the convention for elimination of discrimination against women, convention on the rights of the child, other kinds of conferences, what we would call sort of soft law, and then these, these recent um, General Assembly and Human Rights Council resolutions. Why tell you all of that? Well, in part to sort of tell, give you the, the law, in many ways, is a backwards-looking phenomenon, okay? And it, to understand how it is that now the idea of calling water a human right didn't just come out of thin air. So for a lot of people, this makes perfect sense. But for lawyers, they want to be looking back and say, okay, well, where can we see the evidence that this is, in fact, how we should be thinking about this? And then what does it even mean? So we're not talking about everybody today gets the glass of water in their hands, but essentially we're talking about a series of criteria. And so uh, this is the ideal, right? That everybody would have access to sufficient quantities of water. And human rights law doesn't give us specifics about what that means, but there are references, for example, to WHO guidelines where, for example, uh, 20 liters is considered basic access, 20 liters per person per day, which is frankly a pretty small amount. I mean, if you think about how much we in the U.S. consume on a daily basis for drinking, bathing, doing our dishes, doing our laundry, it's, it's many times uh, more than that. We're, we're way beyond optimal access. Physical accessibility, the idea that water should be, uh, you should be able to ex access it in a reasonable fashion, that it's safe to drink, and that one thing is within the international discourse, okay? Water is said to be, needs to be affordable. This does not mean free. So when we're talking about this, when we come back to our case study 
in Mumbai, one of the things that people in Mumbai, and frankly in many parts of the world, is that it's the poor, the people who are not connected to the networks, are in fact paying more for basic services like water than the well-to-do who are actually connected to the pipes and in fact wind up often with subsidized rates. And then uh, water being acceptable as well. So does this concept mean anything to anyone progressive realization? So it's an idea that actually comes right out of the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. And essentially what it says is that states do not have to provide all those grandiose rights that I told you guys about, right? The right to health care, the right to an adequate standard of living, the right to food, the right to education, and now water. States don't have to provide these immediately overnight because there was a recognition that that's an impossible goal. But rather, states are supposed to be using maximum available resources to ensuring the progressive realization of these rights. And what this really means is, is that it's also not simply about just the allocation of money, but it's ensuring proper regulations, ensuring that the right is protected, such as ensuring it's not polluted, that you're not arbitrarily interfering with that right, for example, arbitrarily cutting off your water without any kind of recourse, that would be respecting the right, and then of course fulfilling, trying to actually build the systems. Well, what I want to talk about tonight, though, actually has to do with local laws that, in fact, create barriers to the realization of those rights. And in fact, you've got local officials that want to be providing water and sanitation services to people living in Calabunga and other non-notified slums, but feel like their arms are tied by the way the local regulations and the laws that are in place. And so this is actually an image of a book that within the human rights system, usually experts are appointed to study new issues. So one was appointed a special rapporteur on this issue, and she wrote this book. And in it, she makes a really good point that uh, I'd like you to take a look at. Essentially that the fact that the provision of a basic service like water or sanitation is in many ways tied to ownership of water, excuse me, to, to land ownership. And the fact that we're conflating the two, the fact that authorities may be reluctant to allow the provision of a basic service like water, which has tremendous health consequences, tremendous economic consequences, because you can think about the amount of time people spend gathering water instead of, say, sending their kids to school or going to work uh, because they're concerned about legalizing water. And so the proposal that I want to make to you tonight is why don't we think about separating the two, separating these larger questions around land tenure and land security from something that is just so essential to basic human survival like the provision of water. Now, We've just talked about the, inter the international context, but in India, uh, the Supreme Court has also, in various cases, had this really resounding uh, human rights language in its jurisprudence. And uh, India has probably, I think, the largest constitution in, in the world. Uh, and one of its articles on the right to live has been expansively defined to include, for example, the right to water. <coughs> And in another case, so there are various cases like this where the court has essentially said the right to life in India, in our constitution, means a whole host of things, including the right to water. But the question is, how is it that we can have these grand pronouncements that then, in fact, don't live up to the reality of people, the millions of people living on the ground? So with that, um, to kind of bring this back, what I want to do in the last part of my talk is now try to stitch together these two halves. So we've already talked a little bit about the context uh, in non-notified slums. We've talked about this idea of water as a human right. And now I want to focus on these actual these legal barriers. And I want to do so 
by focusing on two different kinds of scenarios. The first is this 1995 cutoff rule. And I know that we're going to be hearing a lot more about um, slum, the history of slum policy from Professor Weinstein. So this is really just going to be a preview into it. But essentially, um, if you recall, I mentioned this group, Pukar, that was doing this work in Calabunga. And they were wondering, why is it that we can't get water provided to these people living in this slum? We keep hearing all of this stuff about this 1995 cutoff rule. What does it really mean? And so I said, you know, this is an issue that, is, uh, that I'm going to investigate. So what I did is I actually just went and looked up a whole bunch of boring rules and regulations to try to do what lawyers do, which is uh, read the statutes, read the regulations, and try to interpret them. And so uh, essentially came upon something that seems really rather mundane title, right? These hydraulic engineer water charges rule. But essentially this little provision gives the hook to who's getting access to water in slums. And I want to focus your attention on this. I mentioned we're going to be talking about this 1995 cutoff rule. Uh, notice that that's right there. That They will give connections to slums that have come into existence prior to January 1st, 1995. So to place, very briefly place this 1995 cutoff rule in context, and you're going to hear more about this. You should, so India achieved its independence in 1947. And in the first few decades after independence, there was really this policy of uh, demolition of slums. I think this is both because the idea that if you demolish them, people won't come back. Uh, part of it, I think, is perhaps tied to this Gandhian ideal of rural village life. Um, but essentially, in the 1970s, there was kind of a recognition that, hey, we keep demolishing these slums, people keep coming back, maybe we ought to actually try and improve them. So in Maharashtra, which is the state in which Mumbai is located, passes this act in 1971, uh, to actually, basically, it's the, it, it sets forth the process through which slums can be rehabilitated. But in doing so, it introduces this notion of cutoffs. The idea being, well, we want to help the folks who are here now, because we know we can't kick them up, kick them up. But we don't want to discourage anybody else coming. So, you've been here. <laughs> Uh, and they did the first cutoff in 1996. So they went around and they did a census and they said, okay, you've been here, you get a photo pass. You, on the other hand, have showed up in the following year, and so guess what? You don't get any protection. So essentially this idea of a cutoff was, let's help the people who are here now, but discourage new people from coming in. This kind of a cutoff was, uh, several of them were instituted. The one that concerns us now, happened uh, basically in the elections, more recent elections, I think it was in 2000, where a political party came to power. And you can imagine that lots of people are living in slums, and if you're a local politician, you want those votes. How do you get those votes? You make promises, right? You promise, you make promises. And so one of the promises that was made was, hey, uh, we're going to give lots of free housing, 800,000 free homes, so 4 million slum dwellers, if you've been on the electoral rolls as of Jan 1, 1995, okay? And so this idea, what I discovered when I was looking into this, was that this 1995 cutoff rule was being conflated with coverage under this act. And so I did the, the little bit of work that I found, basically said that Slum Areas Act, from 1971, which had been amended in various ways, essentially meant if you wanted to be rehabilitated under this act, uh, and by rehabilitation, this could mean access to basic services, a better home, what have you, uh, it was being conflated with this act. When I went to Mumbai uh, last spring and actually talked with some officials, they said, yeah, that's right. We're not allowed to provide water or sanitation to anybody that's any slum that's been uh, created after 1995 because we're not allowed to do so. And I said, well, and they said, we'd like to do so, but we don't have that authority. In fact, I think they're wrong. I think that they, in fact, have more authority under the existing regulations and laws than they do. So anyway, I'm trying to 
push this on them as a way of interpreting their laws, but to try to understand this, and this gets pretty technical, so I'm going to just try to give you the kind of gloss at the high level. But the first thing I think to realize is when we talk about land security, we're not talking about black and white. There is really this gray scale continuum where we have some people who are legally there owning their land or with proper leases, and then there are people who are in these non-notified areas, but then there are these notified slums that are somewhere in the middle. So we can think about this kind of grayscale legality, where there's a lot of people who live in this gray area. What does that mean? It generally means that they, if you're, for example, notified, uh, you may not actually have legal title to where you're living, but you've got a lot of protections, and for the most part, you're not going to be kicked out without some kind of process. And what I, the argument that I have been trying to make is there's a conflation between this idea of being notified and this 1995 cutoff rule. And in fact, if you take a close look at the statute, that there's a separate provision whereby these 1995 people actually get better stuff. They're actually more protected. They get more protections because they basically cannot be evicted unless it's in the larger public interest. This is actually better than just being notified. So then it leads to the question, well, what, what does notified really mean? So it turns out that notified actually just meant it came, came from simply uh, placing a notification in the official gazette. And then what really struck me is that what they're notifying is you're basically saying this area here, we're calling you a slum. We're going to designate you as a slum. And we're defining the slum as a place that's unfit for human habitation. Think about that. We're talking about places that are in fact legally classified as unfit for human habitation, and lack of water being one of those key criteria. But notably, land tenure, in the, in, under these Maharashtra laws, land tenure, legality has nothing to do with it, right? So you may say, well, a slum is where people live when you don't own the land. In fact, that's not the legal definition. It actually turns on whether or not the place is unfit for human habitation. And when you get notified, you're eligible for these rehabilitation schemes that I know Professor Weinstein has, has studied a lot uh, in, in a different slum, that, that be. And so, coming back to this very mundane, very prosaic water charges rule. You know, we, earlier, a few slides back, I showed this to you and I focused on the first half of this, prior to 1995. But now I'm focusing on the second half of this. And what I'm suggesting is that, in fact, the local authorities could notify slums that are that were created after 1995, that doesn't mean they get all the protections of this protected occupier class, but it means that they could at least provide water. And this is in some ways what I'm trying to say about disentangling or separating this notion of free homes and land tenure and all these sort of thornier, bigger questions from a much more simple question around can we at least give people basic access to water. But the reality is, is that the politics is still, when you, when you sort of, this is all very live stuff in Mumbai. And in fact, for example, uh, the Dharavi slums that I know uh, Professor Weinstein has studied actually got an exception to the 2000 cutoff rule. And there's, so there's this whole sort of dynamic about does the government have the authority to actually uh, extend, extend the cutoffs? This is in the courts. So we, we will sort of sidestep that for now. But the larger point I want to make is that you have these kind of grandiose notions of human rights at the international level and at the national level, but that are coming into conflict with laws that are on the ground. And so coming back to thinking about what we've covered so far, there's still one final piece to this, which I think in some ways, I hope, makes you a little angry, which is, so not only have we been talking about this 1995 cutoff rule, but in fact, it turns out that my argument completely falls apart for this, I think it's about 5% of slums that are actually on central government land. So 
for these slums, um, we're th talking about slums actually, like Calabunda, that's on a wharf, port authorities, railways, airplanes. Think about where there's often lots of space for people to be building homes, right? All of those places in India tend to be owned by the central government, and this is a holdover from the colonial era. So for central government, for, for those slums, my 1995, post-1995 cutoff rule doesn't hold much water. Why? Because India is a federal country like the United States, and so you have this dynamic where state and local laws, which is what I've been focusing on, in fact, don't apply to property that is owned by the national government. And so if you, now I want you to think back to what we were just talking about, right? The international covenant, India's jurisprudence, who are the actors under international law? Is it the local government? No, oh, it's the national governments. It's the state governments that are in fact the actors under international law. India agreed to and acceded to that covenant that sort of was the basis of the right to water in 1979. And in fact, other arms of India's government has been making this massive push to try to do urban renewal. There's this campaign now, the scheme under the Rajiv Avat Yojana scheme that in fact has sought to do away with cutoffs and this is from their website and you can read the bottom. The scheme is applicable to all sums within a city, whether notified or non-notified, whether on land belonging to central government. This sounds great. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is, is that the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. That in fact, uh, in order, so you've got these ministries advocating for uh, slum renewal. Don't worry, don't have these cutoff policies. But in fact, you have the port authorities, the railways, the airports not providing this necessary form and notice of no objection certificate to allow the municipalities to actually provide those services. And when I was talking with the um, uh, Mumbai municipal commissioners responsible for this, they said, look, we're not going to invest our resources. We want to provide water services here, but we're not going to do that unless we get those certificates because we will then be in violation of central government law. So you've got this really strange conundrum where, you know, there is some, you know, I found some articles, this stuff is very live, uh, where there's some hope that perhaps there may be some uh, renewal. And I think the reality is, is that people need places to live. And that when you've got a commercial center like Mumbai, people will come and will live in places that are quote unquote unfit for human habitation because it's how they can provide for their families. And as we'll talk about more about uh, Mumbai's, the, the, the history of slum policy, this has been hotly debated. But the reality is, is that you can't just demolish these places and assume people won't come back. And so it's with this, um, that I'm suggesting that we need to be thinking about the provision of services uh, without it. The, the last piece I want to I wanna just talk about is I also think that there's some interesting ways to make a legal argument that is specifically targeted to the central government. Uh, one is, is, if you recall when I was talking about protect, respect, fulfill, so there's this idea of rights being negative versus positive. Positive rights meaning the state has affirmative obligations to provide the right. Negative being, okay, don't interfere with my rights. So in the United States, when we think about our rights, the Bill of Rights, we're thinking government, don't interfere with my rights. I actually think that there's an interesting argument that could be made where uh, you could look at, say, Indians, India's jurisprudence and that those cases that have been successful, that have led to that really kind of broad language, in fact, were framed as negative rights. So I think that there's an argument to be made about saying, in fact, the national government is interfering with the local government's efforts, so a sort of negative type argument. And, um, and then in addition, what's also really interesting is so India amended its constitution to actually provide greater authority to 
the urban local bodies, the municipalities, and to the panchayats, which are in the villages. So they actually have constitutional status. So now think about this, right? When you've actually got local officials who want to be taking steps, but in fact are being prevented from doing so by the national government, at least one arm of it, when the rest of the arms of the national government are saying, you should take these steps, I think you've got the potential for a pretty strong legal argument. And so with that, I want to just conclude with, once again, this idea of you've got these really much larger questions around slum policy, housing, the need for affordable housing. But yet, in the interim, though, you know, that has been a problem that has been uh, taking decades. People have been grappling with it. But that in the interim, for the sake of basic human dignity, can we think about interpreting the laws and analyzing the barriers that exist so that people can at least have enough safe drinking water and enough water for sanitation purposes to lead dignified lives. So with that, um, I'd like to thank you and just as a review where we sort of came today. We started thinking about Kalabunda and the, the that water access that a slum, non-notified slum in that port had we then tried to say, well, look at all these high, you know, this discourse at the international level and the, uh, and the Indian jurisprudence, these great pronouncements around water as a human right. And then we really tried to say, well, why is there this disconnect? And ultimately focused on the kind of interplay, very complicated set of laws, but that I think there are, in fact, are ways to actually, I mean, ideally change them, but in the interim, at least, interpret them in a way that is much more consistent with human rights approach. So, thank you. But uh, I want to thank um, the organizers, obviously, of the Open Classroom, and this is just a great, um, a great uh, series to be involved in, and a great panel particularly to be involved in. And I really appreciate Ms. Marty's talk, because I've actually spent the better part of a decade myself trying to wrap my head around, not as a lawyer, I have to say, so I have that disclaimer, as a sociologist, but trying to wrap my head around sort of the layers of regulation and the complexities and I have a difficult time understanding it, let alone explaining it as clearly as you have. And so um, I think her talk raises some really critical and important issues that um, at the risk of um, repeating, and I don't want to um, kind of cover much of the same ground, but in my own research on Dharavi, which, um, as Ms. Morty said, is actually a notified slum and has some real differences um, with Kalo Banda. Um, but also some similarities and fit within the same general framework. And I think that we can kind of take a step back and kind of think about that framework. But within that, and within the context of my own research, I sort of had some similar realizations and recognitions about um, that, that came up in her talk, and I'd like to highlight some that I think are most significant. And the first one is this issue of moral hazards or the opportunistic influx that um, municipal officials and much of civil society has is, is, is raised significant concerns about. The idea that if you create a certain set of incentives, provide basic life-sustaining resources to residents um, in informal settlements among the urban poor, then the rural poor will flood into cities, will you know, overtake cities, um, they'll burst at their capacity, and that they will you know, make demands on cities that they're simply not able to, um, to capture. And that that's sort of where the, the, cut, the cutoff date, which is also often referred to as a tolerance date, um, is thought of. Sort of we'll tolerate this population, but beyond the state, we, we won't tolerate any more of you coming into the city. And, um, and I think it's, it's important to recognize what a fundamental oversimplification and misunderstanding of the complex push and pull factors that actually underlie the decisions um, that you know, are part of the rural to urban migration. And so boiling down um, sort of the question of how you provide resources for uh, in a limited context and create um, a system where the municipality has the opportunity to actually provide resources to a limited number of people, to think about it in terms of this opportunistic influx um, is, a, is a misstep, and a misstep on which so much of these policies are ultimately based upon. And the second point that, um, that came up in Ms. Morty's talk that I think is, is 
absolutely critical. And I, I was really happy to see sort of the, the bringing in the panchayat um, system and the 73rd and the 74th Amendment to the Indian Constitution into that as well. And this is the issue of sort of the intergovernmental conflicts and the ways that um, policies and regulations between the state government, the central government, and municipal governments actually create huge barriers to service delivery and to representation in an effective way. And cities, you know, are complex geographies that have overlaying, overlapping, and conflicting jurisdictions on top of them, let alone land ownership that actually belongs to different um, agencies of the government. And so to think about the intergovernmental conflicts and the ways that those create disincentives or create barriers to actually effective um, policy implementation and service delivery is a hugely important point that I don't think can be um, overemphasized. And to sort of add another layer onto that, um, the, over much of the past two decades, we've actually seen um, a, a split in the case of Mumbai and the state that Mumbai is in, in Maharashtra between the party in power at the central government level and at the state level. And currently, they're both um, ruled by Congress governments, but it hasn't been the case for much of the past two decades. And so, overlaid on top of those intergovernmental conflicts, actually arise a whole set of interparty conflicts that exacerbate these um, these conflicting layers of um, of policy, but also the conflicting interests that underlie them. And the, the third point that is um, you know, sort of the, the most major component of, of the talk today, and what I want to elaborate a bit more on, is the idea that basic services like water and sanitation would be subsumed under a housing policy. And that seems odd to a certain degree, but I think that um, it's, a, it's a critically important issue that um, Ms. Morty's talk really kind of looked inside sort of the perverse set of regulatory mechanisms that underlie that. But, um, but I think we can go a bit further in sort of thinking about what um, the history of this and, and how um, it came to pass that, um, that we thought of these sort of complex settlements that um, in the case of, of, of uh, Kaulabunder, you know, they're, they're primarily workers who are working in the adjacent um, port um, in the wharf and the harbor. Um, but in a place like Garabi, there are um, commercial settlements and manufacturing settlements, as well as residential settlements. But the idea that the policy framework that would govern these complex places where people live, work, um, access basic resources, and try to, try to make lives for themselves would be boiled down to such a narrow issue as housing and, um, and, and land tenure. Is a, um, is a fundamental misstep, and I think um, if we begin to disentangle that, we can begin to sort of redress some of the problems that have arisen from this difficulty. And, um, and so it's in, in that context, in this um, you know, sense of the, um, these contextual questions that I want to pose about um, the first fundamental question, you know, taking a step back historically, and how did these low-income neighborhoods, and most of them are low-income, many of them are low-income, certainly as in the case of Kalabandar, but a place like Dharavi that um, has a much longer history and goes back much further and actually has a significant amount of economic diversity within the settlement, but have spaces that we can generally say are, you know, are not middle-class or elite settlements, but are basically working-class or, or, or lower-class settlements. Um, how they became slums. You know, sort of what is the discursive ship that underlies that? Because it wasn't always the case. Really, um, the, the term slum doesn't really enter into the Indian policy and planning discourse until the 1950s, really. And, um, and to kind of take a step back and think about how we sort of deem these areas that are these complex settlements, but then put them under the definition, as Ms. Marti said, of sort of unfit for human habitation. And sort of thinking about what it means that they're considered slums and how these neighborhoods ultimately became slums. And then the second um, question that sort of you know, follows from that is how did the complex set of policies and regulatory frameworks that govern these spaces get boiled down to a simply an issue of land and housing? And how did slum policy become synonymous with housing policy and become synonymous with, um, with simply the idea of provision of housing? And I think that's an important piece of the, of the larger context, the, the social and political history that sort of helps us understand you know, how these basic services get lost under housing policy. And then the third question is the question of civil society. Mumbai actually has a very <coughs> vibrant um, civil society with a, a large number of organizations and institutions that advocate on behalf of slum residents and pavement dwellers. 
and um, and how is it that these issues aren't at the forefront of their um, of their agendas? Why aren't they agitating for demands? Given the recognition that um, you know that the Indian government recognizes the right to um, right to life and has upheld that in significant number of court decisions, and the fact that it's signed on to um, to these international human rights documents that um, that recognize the right to water, those would be sort of very significant openings into which these civil society organizations could make demand and could place pressure. And um, and I'll, I'll get to this point sort of last, but how along with the narrowing of slum policy to become simply about housing policy, the significant housing insecurity under which most Mumbai residents find themselves under has narrowed the set of demands that get made to agitation and struggles around the right to stay put. And in this context, I, I, I borrow a term from Chester Hartman, who's looked at anti-gentrification struggles, primarily in the context of San Francisco, but, um, but struggles around sort of what it means to not actually be moved from the space that you're currently occupying. Um, and that is sort of what civil society organizations in Mumbai have had to become increasingly focused on because of the threats of, of housing insecurity and the, um, the vulnerability that arises from periodic evictions and demolition drives under which um, particularly residents of non-notified slums um, find themselves under on a, on a fairly constant basis. And so in this sense, I want to I talk about the role that um, these social mobilizations and these civil society organizations play, but um, I want to try to understand why it is that these just simply haven't been part of their most pressing demands because sort of everything else gets pushed to the side when the um, residents they're advocating on behalf of are facing such um, pressing threats. So um, I just wanted to, to um, add a point that, I, that it was actually in the recognition of, um, of this 1995 cutoff date and the distinction between notified and non-notified slums that actually um, had me go a bit deeper into this social um, and political history of the policy and the regulations. I had come to Mumbai to study um, really uh, the present moment and the impact of globalization and India's integration in the global economy on how people make claims to housing. And, um, and while I was doing this research, I was actually living directly adjacent to a non-notified slum. And, um, and actually, the, the quality of the housing was actually fairly adequate. Over time, people had, um, had made significant improvements to their homes and um, you know, where sort of found materials became fortified with bricks, became fortified with cement. And the housing quality was actually um, you know, of, a, a fairly decent, um, of a fairly decent quality. But I noticed early on, mostly by the smell, that there were no toilet blocks in the settlement. And, um, and I began to ask questions about that, to poke around about, you know, why this, you know, settlement that looked like it had been there for, you know, at least a decade, um, didn't have access to a toilet. And, um, and then, you know, probing a bit further, there wasn't the presence of a water tap within that settlement. And it became apparent to me that, it, you know, the, the main finding and the main argument that Ms. Morty is making, that it is actually legally not allowable <coughs> to provide those basic services to the settlement because it hasn't been notified. It hasn't actually, you know, been listed in the Gazette as a particular slum that's, um, that qualifies for, um, you know, these basic services, which seems um, really, um, you know, it seemed perverse. And it, it was sort of on that recognition that I realized that I had to sort of understand the social history of these policies in order to understand how these, um, how these, uh, the present moment is sort of unfolding. So I want to spend a bit on uh, how neighborhoods became slums. I mean, the term slum is a very contentious word, and it's a word that there's been a lot of debate and discussion about whether it's even a valuable term to use to describe these settlements. And, um, and you find in the literature a, um, a significant set of um, you know, disparity between you know, the terminology that's utilized. And actually the term slum had, had pretty much been purged from the urban planning lexicon in the 1960s and 70s under a whole set of um, you know, social movements that recognized that these spaces weren't actually marginal. That there was sort of a myth of marginality that underlay them, and that the, um, the work of actually constructing homes in these areas is something that should be lauded and should be recognized as, um, as something quite um, significant. And, um, and so it was the term self-help communities or the term self-built communities sort of became the more appropriate terminology. 
And it was actually through the move of um, sort of an agenda setting by the um, UN Habitat and the World Bank to actually put the term slum and the, and the issue of slums back onto the um, international policy agenda. And they published in um, 2003 the Cities Without Slums Initiative and really began to make demands to kind of bring back the concept of slums and raise awareness about the conditions in these settlements so as to justify an intervention within them. But, um, but that move and that sort of discursive shift back to thinking about these areas as slums is actually, um, you know, has been challenged and contested because it, 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 it conflates a whole variety of housing arrangements under a pretty um, dehumanizing concept. And, um, and so, you know, sort of thinking about what are the, the trade-offs in using the term. And I actually, add, you know, I, I, I make the point that it's actually um, valuable in this context. It has to be contextual. And in this context, um, the word slum is so prevalent in the policy documents, in um, people's discourse, in the, in the case of Mumbai, the, the Marathi equivalent is um, Soparpati. And Soparpati is the word that's really used to describe these settlements. And I think, you know, and so I, I, I use the terminology that my informants use and that people within these settlements use. But I think we should use it with the recognition of what sort of being done, what kind of work is being done by, by flattening the diversity of different housing arrangements under this concept. So I thought that that was an important point to raise. But I want to um, kind of think about where these places came from. So we find records of the first um, sort of uh, discussion of what we now think of to be slums in around the 1860s. And the 1860s was a period in which um, uh, the textile mill industry really took off. The first mills were built in Mumbai in the 1850s. And by the 1860s, um, uh, the industry was hugely expanding, in part because of the United States Civil War and the ways in which um, cotton textiles from the US were cut off to Britain and they turned to India to supply, um, to supply the mills in Lancashire and, and, and Manchester. And, um, and the city population boomed. And, um, and uh, residents flocked from you know, outlying areas. And in some cases, they were um, refugees coming because of famines or because of droughts, but also because of the job opportunities that were created within the city. And, um, and this quote is from a, a municipal official from the 1860s, you know, recognizing wretched rows of kajal and thatched huts hastily assembled by migrants to the city close to their places of work. And this is how most of the housing was actually constructed for working class residents through much of the um, late 19th and early 20th century. And there was some housing that was constructed by textile mill owners or by um, the municipal officials, the Bombay Improvement Trust or the Bombay Development Department also constructed some housing, um, sort of working class um, dormitory style housing. But the overwhelming majority of housing for low income residents and for the working class within the city was actually self-constructed in this manner. And, um, and the term wasn't, you know, in the term slum, there wasn't really the terminology that we now have to think about it. And really, as late as the 1948 um, master plan for the city of Mumbai, or for Greater Mumbai, um, talks about <coughs> these types of neighborhoods, and particularly Dharavi, which is um, you know, the largest and most um, sort of infamous of these settlements, as low-income neighborhoods. And, um, and actually, you know, the, the plan is an interesting relic, it's an interesting <coughs> document, because it had a whole set of recommendations for improving access to sanitation, improving access to water, but those recommendations were never um, implemented, and it really existed as a plan, at least these pieces of the plan as a plan on paper alone. But what um, is most significant about this document, I think, is, is to um, read it for the language in which these settlements are discussed as. And in this sense, they're, they're talked about as low-income housing units, I mean, low-income neighborhood units. And they're actually, the plan laid out, and I have a, a, the graphic that's up there, up there on the bottom, is actually a, a proposal for sort of the ideal type of um, low-income neighborhood taking existing, you know, what we now think of as slums, um, re-laying um, infrastructure and improving basic conditions, um, constructing an adequate number of housing, um, amount of housing, and, um, and integrating them more deeply into the city through the use of open space. And, you know, and, it, and it looks actually really beautiful compared to how we think about um, these settlements today. But, you know, as I said, the plan was really um, never implemented. And, uh, but really in the 1950s and 60s is when we begin to hear the term slum enter into the planning discourse. 
And it was really, I mean, there are a variety of ways in which it entered into the discourse, but, um, but it was largely the global circulation of planning ideas, um, including the, um, the uh, urban renewal and slum clearance programs that were underway in the United States and the UK at the time and the ways in which that was sort of proposed as a sort of a reasonable option for dealing with these settlements. It was, you know, sort of internationally verified as a way that, um, you know, that low-income neighborhoods that were determined to be of, um, of shoddy quality, where, um, you know, they were defined unfit for human habitation, could be bulldozed and presumably alternative, more improved um, housing conditions could be built. And so it was largely in this context that you know the 1950s um, strategy of dealing with slums simply by demolishing them um, you know, really took hold, and it you know it it, it gained resonance. And uh, but you know so it's in part this way that um, that the concept of slum um, entered into the discourse. But it was also at this time when there was significant amount of population growth among the working class in the city, and um, and how the needs of this population were largely being met. So there was a lot of self-built housing, but there was also, um, you know, also um, increasing organized criminal activity underway in the city. Um, Bombay, the, the state of Bombay at the time, actually um, had um, alcohol prohibition. And so, you know, much like we think of organized crime in the United States, in Mumbai there was a thriving um, bootlegging industry. And much of it was centered in the informal settlements where they were sort of off the radar of um, municipal authorities. But then, um, you know, at this time, sort of thinking about land, access to housing, um, uh, access to water, access to electricity and basic resources and the provision of them were carried out in much the same way as illicit goods like alcohol provision. And, um, and much of this, um, you know, need was being met by these slumlords or gundas as they're called in, um, in local discourse and, and the methods of sort of strong arm tactics and, um, you know, sort of referred to as gundagiri. Um, is, is really was sort of the main mechanism. And so when we think about these ideas, um, I mean, these spaces um, sort of falling under the, the general construct and the stigma that comes along with that of being as slums, the idea is that they're you know, criminal spaces, they're dirty spaces, there's um, illicit activity underway in them, and there's a lot of sort of, um, you know, sort of illicit power, you know, illicit power structure. And, um, and so the term was applied to it, not simply because it was a descriptive term, but because it came with all of those sort of moral implications associated with it. And when we think about the concept of a slum and the idea that slum policies are what guard, you know, what um, sort of organize the distribution of resources within these settlements, it's within this context of sort of thinking about the moral implications of what it means to be living in a slum. And so um, I think sort of when we think about what a slum is, you know, having some of that <laughs> background, I think, is actually fairly helpful. And so the second piece of that story is, you know, so then you have slums, okay? So by the 1950s and the 1960s, we have slums, you know, as, you know, sort of, you know, not at that point the, the dominant mode of housing provision in Mumbai, but certainly today, um, where with the majority of the city at least half um, living in these um, informal settlements. But how slums, you know, these sort of diverse economic um, as well as residential spaces, commercial as well as production spaces, um, simply became a framed as a housing issue and as a land issue and, and really just about providing a roof to the residents in, in terms of the slum policy has its own history and should also be you know, sort of put into its historical and social context. And so, as Ms. Morty said, you know, in the 1950s, um, slum problems were primarily addressed through clearance. That was the dominant mode of intervention. And in 1991, Maharashtra enacts a slum policy, as we've already heard. And in part, um, the enactment of the um, 1971 slum policy was really responding to pressure from the central government to a large degree, they had written into um, you know each layer of five-year plans is a, a sort of a central planning um, instrument for sort of development planning in India. And in the second five-year plan and the third five-year plan, we see um, some language about slum clearance and slum improvement. But because of this division of powers between the central government, the state government, and then you know since the 73rd, 74th amendment, municipal government's now being written into that, um, the central government actually didn't have any authority to carry out urban development and planning because it's, divided, de, uh, it's defined as a state subject. So um, the central government could create a set of carrots and a set of sticks 
for encouraging states to have some sort of policy in place for dealing with this. And um, so in 1956, the central government actually enacted its own slum policy for, um, for um, uh, union territory left, which includes New Delhi and other um, territories that fall under the, uh, the national, the central government. And in 1971, Maharashtra, like many of the other states in, in um, India, responds by um, creating a slum policy. And so, in the, so the 1971 sort of set the policy framework and the 1970s and 80s, we saw a whole set of programs that had emerged within that policy framework. Many of them receiving World Bank backing and World Bank support that, um, that were premised primarily on slum upgradation and slum improvement. And, um, and so these were, you know, they were certainly not perfect programs by any means, and, and some of these programs include um, what we call SIP, the Slum Improvement Program, SUP, the Slum Upgradation Program, um, you know, and other, you know, acronyms that, you know, there's a whole litany of them. And, um, and they were largely premised on a sites and services model, the recognition that you could um, give people plots of land and allow connections to water facilities and connections to sanitation, and to think about the fact that people need more than simply a roof over their heads, that they need access to these basic life-sustaining services. And, um, and you know, there were, they were not sort of you know, extensively successful. They touched a very small proportion of the population. But thinking about the policy framework that underlay them, there, um, there is you know, a framework for thinking about sort of the place of, of a home in a larger social context. But in the, 1980, in the 1990s, we see the slum policy shift to being focused exclusively on housing. And, um, and Ms. Marty writes about this in, uh, um, in the longer paper that, um, that the presentation she gave today was based, but she didn't, she didn't talk about it much today, sort of thinking about sort of this populist policy that had emerged in the context of um, elections. And um, first in 1991, um, the you know, local governments, um, the, actually at the state level, the Shivsena party with the, the, with the BJP um, contesting against the, uh, um, the Congress party. And the, um, the you know, as, as she said, that we think about you know, how you win elections, you make promises to slum dwellers because they make up the majority of the city. And the promise was made of free housing to, um, 400,000 housing, 400, just like ridiculously, um, sort of astronomically large um, promises of, you know, that the government made that they would provide free housing to the residents, and um, and it was a remarkably popular policy, and you know, then it wasn't the only reason that um, the party got elected, but um, but the party making those promises did get elected, and so they had to fulfill their promises. And so uh, it was sort of in that current, sort of fulfilling that promise that we have the current slum rehabilitation scheme, which is um, focused exclusively on housing construction. It was the promise of um, you know, a free housing unit. At the time, I think it was 180 square feet um, in the unit. Now it's upwards of uh, 225 square feet, but all of this varies, and probably it's actually closer to 300 square feet um, that are promised under the slum rehabilitation scheme. And, um, but how the program was financed actually was by taking slumlands, um, taking you know, horizontally organized populations, and moving them into high rise and mid rise buildings. So that clears up a significant amount of land. And the cross subsidization scheme uses land as a resource to give to builders to develop other lands. You know, to develop um, market rate properties that they can then use to pay for their, um, you know, what they're providing to the slum dwellers free of charge. And so what that means is you end up with a landscape of buildings and nothing but buildings. So you have the slum dwellers component and you have a sale component, you know, that developers are using to recoup their benefits, but you have no parks. You have no water and sanitation facilities. You have no, um, you know, amenities like schools or basic community level resources, and you have no town planning. What you have is a landscape of buildings, and um, and it was sort of in this context. And and and, the, and and as this program became hugely popular, because who wouldn't want free housing in a remarkably expensive city where nobody can afford housing, middle class can afford housing, let alone um, informal residents. Um, that um, that when this policy gained resonance and gained popularity, these other programs 
slum rehabilitation or the slum improvement scheme, the, the slum improvement program, that each of these um, sort of fell away. And housing policy became focused on the provision of buildings. And, um, and within that, everything else gets lost. And so we sort of see how, um, how you know, these diverse, you know, economically diverse to a certain degree, low in working class income neighborhoods become slums, and how slum policy becomes building policy. And within that, there is a sense of no other provision of basic resources. And so the third piece of this kind of narrowing is, uh, is how social mobilizations narrow. And um, there is, a, as I said um, in the beginning, there's a very vibrant civil society within Mumbai. There are many housing advocacy organizations and, um, and um, livelihoods and social justice organizations that agitate on behalf of the rights of slum dwellers. And there's, a, you know, well, there's an interesting history for how these, um, this diverse set of organizations really emerged in the first place. And in many cases, um, they're a reaction to um, a period in which um, India's democracy was suspended for 21 months in 1975 through 1971. Um, it's a period that we call the emergency. It was under the regime of then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. Um, she shut down democracy and carried out a whole set of egregious violations of people's, um, of people's human rights and their, um, and their, basic, um, you know, their basic dignity. And among the practices that were carried out under this authoritarian regime were massive slum demolitions in cities across India. And um, pavement dwellers were evicted, and slum residents were evicted, along with you know, you know, really horrid um, forced sterilization campaigns that were actually rampant across rural areas as well. But in addition to these <laughs> abuses that were underway in terms of people being evicted from their land, there was also a complete secession on any um, mobilization, any um, you know, democratic voice or resistance to this. And, um, and the emergency regime was lifted in, in 1977. And at that point, you see an outpouring of social movements that um, emerged in response that had been suppressed during the emergency period. And the 1980s is actually a period of mass mobilization, certainly in Mumbai and in other cities across India. And um, you see numerous groups emerge and begin making demands on government, in part because although the emergency regime had ended, and um, the demolitions um, and the democracy was restored, the demolitions continued. And um, the demolitions were actually carried out by the um, Bombay Municipal Corporation in really egregious ways in the 1980s. And, um, and numerous um, you know, social justice organizations came um, about in that period with really diverse sets of agendas that represent um, you know, a whole diversity of ideological positions and strategic um, sort of approaches to advocating on behalf of the rights, you know, from the most leftist, you know, communist organizations to the most um, sort of um, uh, concession-based uh, reformist organizations that are willing to work very closely with government. But as the evictions have continued, and particularly as land prices have risen in the city and the pressures for development have increased, um, evictions have sort of become the main issue on which most of these um, organizations have had to become focused. And so you see not only sort of a narrowing of the policy around evictions, but you also see or a policy around housing, but you see a narrowing of the social um, justice organizations and the social mobilizations um, focusing primarily on the right to stay put and resisting the evictions that are on their way across the city. And so you end up with sort of a fragmented civil society but that's focused on a very narrow set of issues around um, resisting displacement and resisting eviction. And so when we think about, um, you know, sort of why these demands and why these reforms that Ms. Murphy was, was suggesting could actually be made um, uh, are not really being made in this context, sort of thinking about this history of social mobilization is also an important piece of the story. So, I, you know, there's a, a lot of details covering a lot of, um, you know, historical periods and, and diverse spaces, but I did want to kind of add some of that social and political context that I think, you know, helps us understand a little bit better why in India's most, um, you know, wealthiest city and presumably most global city, um, such a large percentage of the population lacks access to the most basic, um, basic life-sustaining um, services that seem as though um, they would be, you know, basic you know, rights that people would have access to and that they would be um, delivered in a way that, um, that you know, people would be able to get access to. All right. But, you know, they're just failing to deliver it. And so they're just, 
a crummy, lousy government, and the politics is all screwed up. And, and so there you are. There's no water in the very places where it's most essential to life, and we got to bring it. So I'm sitting there thinking, well, where is the water coming from? You know, I got the watershed management hat on. I was like, so where does their water come from? So what would it take to pipe the water down there? So why aren't they doing it? You know, just basic kind of physical things. And is it really true? what you were both kind of implying, that the impediments are all political and legal, and, or is there, you know, are there some bigger issues here about governments and water supplies, maybe even things that we should be looking to inform our, our policies elsewhere in the world besides just India, which certainly seems to have an arcane, convoluted legal system to struggle with. Was that a question? Yes. <laughs> a question. So we, can, we can respond yeah. to it. Um, so do we need to use mics or can I just talk? You guys can hear me? Okay. So I would say that really the engineering challenge is less about water than it is about sanitation. So something like 90% of Mumbai's wastewater is discharged untreated into the waterways. We've already talked about um, the, you know, the fact that there are, so non-notified slums are not gaining access to uh, water, in most cases sanitation, either water being a, a, an important part of that, but even we saw the statistics, even notified slums, uh, the challenges of sanitation are huge. And there, it's actually really an engineering challenge in many instances, because where are you going to actually be putting the pipes? You have house people already living there, so how are you actually going to be creating the pipe infrastructure underneath, uh, and then having an adequate supply of water. And so there's all this, you know, there's various things about the Gates Foundation, you know, reinventing the toilet and dry toilets and all of these things. But, you know, it's really hard culturally. Um, Indians are use water to, um, when they're going to the restroom. So it's, so you sort of need both pieces of that. So I'd say there it's, that is, um, from my standpoint, the real engineering challenge, where even when you've got willing parties and you've got a legal framework that would allow you to do it, it's really challenging because there's no room in these, you know, if you've got 200 square feet, you don't have room and you don't have the pipe work to actually put in a toilet. So you wind up with these block toilets, but then could you imagine going to a community toilet when especially half the time the water's not running, the challenges of keeping that clean, and I will tell you an interesting story, um, and there's a professor over at the GSD that's done some work in Mumbai, and tells a story of how he actually went to Mumbai and built, in a com with a community, this really nice new toilet, uh, and it had on top of it, like, an area for, um, basically that could be used as a community area, and they sort of had all the pieces of it, and then what wound up happening was that the basically sort of the elite in the area, the slum, decided that this was like a really good place for them to basically hang out because it had a good view and all those good things and all of a sudden it got taken over. It got sort of usurped. So I would say um, with water, people are always finding, so to a certain degree there may be instances where it may be hard to pipe in the water physically, but we're not, we're not, I mean, these are not, some of the places we're talking about, that's not, it wouldn't be hard to put at least a community tap in, all right? We're not necessarily talking about taps in everybody's homes. You could be putting in community taps that could, that's much more feasible than the challenges of water. And there are parts of India that, I mean, clearly in the western part where drought is a huge issue, but for the most part, Mumbai, comparatively, uh, water supply is, Okay. Yeah, there actually is a pretty extensive set of reservoirs that the city uses to um, supply water. And, um, and there's actually a really good documentary about the access to water within the city that kind of um, follows, it's called Liquid Cities, and it's available on YouTube. And I recommend um, watching it. It was uh, produced by a geographer named Matthew Gandhi. And, um, and in Liquid City, he, he 
goes to those reservoirs and he talks to the, the engineers who are piping water in. And I would you know, agree with um, Chamilla's point that it's not, um, a, a, the, the infrastructure is actually there. And in this case, you know, and I hate to fall into a trap that, you know, that, that makes it seem as though it's the government, it's all bad and it's problematic. In this case, that's the case. <laughs> and, and I actually think that Mumbai is, uh, is pretty distinct in the context of, of Indian cities. And, um, and the layers of regulation and the layers of, uh, of law, which each have their own political histories associated with them, actually do create disincentives for the adequate provision of resources that, from an engineering perspective, are not impossible to provide. I, I agree, the, the, the toilet issue is the more significant one, but water access. And so when, you know, if you're putting on your World Bank hat, you know, the, the hat that they wear, you know, every time, comes in with, if we're going to give you these loans and we're going to engage in these programs, you must deregulate in the following ways. And the pressure on the Maharashtra government for eliminating some of these laws or for transforming them are significant. And the central government puts the pressure on Maharashtra to do it in the form of, um, you know, of Ray, of the Rajiv Alas Yojana um, plan that Shamila talked about, that, you know, is trying that if they sign on to the program, if they get the resources, then they must apply um, these policies, you know, across regardless of notification or non-notification, cutoff dates or toleration dates. And, um, and so that's another sort of carrot that the central government is utilizing to actually get Maharashtra to create a political context or a policy context that is more conducive to the adequate distribution of resources that are not impossible to distribute. And one of the things that's also a little bit, so Mumbai does have some very unique features, but one of which is it's actually a comparatively well-resourced municipality. So some of the sort of sticks of, I mean, or carrots of funding that work. And, you know, we have that same phenomenon here in the U.S., right, where this, the, the, you know, we see that with healthcare, for example, where there's money to be had if the states will adopt certain policies. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, though, that this interesting interplay where I was talking with uh, municipal officials who were eager to, they understood the health and the economic implications of not of having all of these you know, millions of people living without good access to water or sanitation. But there was something very interesting that ties back to your uh, point about the politics, which is they said, you know, sometimes we, we identify an area, especially for sanitation, we identify an area, this is an area where we've identified, yes, we could put in the piping, we can site a toilet, what have you, uh, the municipality has the engineers to go in and do it, but then, the local uh, MP, the local uh, officials might say, hey, this is actually a good site and I will promise, I want this site because then I can promise to be the one who puts the toilet in there during a campaign promise. And then what the, these municipal officials were sort of complaining about was, you know, you have local political officials making these campaign promises and then following through with pretty shoddy construction and then not hooking them properly up to water, not really kind of going through the proper way that the municipal's engineers would want them to go through. So then you've got this kind of weird conundrum, right, where you've sort of got the bureaucracy and the political system at odds with each other. Hi, uh, I'm John over at the law school. Um, I'm wondering on the funding issue, um, uh, you know, in the West we spend an enormous amount of money putting in our water infrastructure um, in India and, and the rest of the global south, uh, I think funding is a huge issue, and given that you know, um, international monetary investment organizations are really inter interested in um, uh, like sort of neoliberal dropping trade barriers and, and bringing in um, private companies to do this work. Um, to what extent is that um, a real issue because now I see like these fire hoses, people are getting water kind of for free. And these corporations can't come in to do any work really unless they can get everyone on a meter. So how, how, do, how, do this, um, how does that get resolved? Or, or, or what do you think is a good way to do it? So I think what you're touching on, I mean, if I, I actually think that part of the reason 
this idea of water as a human right was recognized uh, when it was in the early 2000s was in part in response to the massive wave, the sort of push towards privatization in many parts of the world. And you know, as I didn't talk about this here, but I think sort of just as a blanket statement, I, I don't think that that idea is inherently at odds with this idea of a human right to water. Um, I think because if you go back and look at sort of human rights discourse, um, when the human rights system was founded, there was a kind of uh, recognition that you could identify these rights, but, the, as, but they would be neutral as to economic models. So the idea is that you could achieve everybody having these certain, you know, housing, health, whatever, now water, but it didn't matter how you actually got there. And I think food, housing, that those are sort of good examples where you see the private sector working. I think one of the challenges, so what you're pointing to is a couple of different things. Number one, I think it's interesting when we go back in history and we think, you know, at one point when the UK was developing its water system, one quarter of all municipal debt was actually for building water infrastructure, right? It's expensive to put in that pipe work. And so we all benefit from this kind of, this, all of the amount of money that was spent, the bonds and the sort of cross subsidization within municipalities. There have been a couple of waves in terms of thinking about how do you find, how now do we finance the expansion of water services? And so part of it has been, well, maybe we should privatize. Maybe we should harness the capital in the private sector, bring all those good business practices, and try to sort of shake up what are sort of corrupt, inefficient government uh, bureaucrats. That may have some merit to it, but part of the challenge is, is that sometimes that is implemented in a blind faith kind of way. And if you think about it, just as you were pointing out, you, a private company is only going to have the incentive to, to put water in places where they're going to recoup their money easily, right? So it may be, well, I'll put it in the easiest areas to reach, right? And I won't worry about trying to get to those spots in the middle of that slum that are really hard to get through, or maybe I have to jump through all these kind of regulatory hoops to get. So you can, you can wind up with, unless you have effective regulation, you could wind up with a scenario that, um, you know, you can't assume that the private actor is going to have the interests of everyone in mind in the same way that a municipality would. The other thing that goes along with that, though, is that with the sort of push towards kind of privatization, there's kind of this idea of ring fencing. So let's think about all of the money coming in from charging for water and recouping that money and using that, sort of isolating out the water debits and credits separately from the rest of the municipal budget, right? So this is kind of really all the dogma now about how do you run a water utility much more efficiently. There's some merit to that, but at the same time, when we go back to our English example, or think about how we all have our water systems, they're really expensive to put in, and they're what we'd call sort of lumpy infrastructure, right? Where there's a huge amount of money that has to be put in initially, so that kind of capital investment can't really be recouped by just charging people for money. And I think, you know, there's enough studies out there that say, yeah, people may have a willingness to pay. Yeah, people are getting, water for free, but it's it's not guaranteed. It's not necessarily good quality. You know, you saw those those poses that were basically snaking through where people are also defecating and there's garbage and there's seawater. You know, that people would be people are already paying for to a certain degree for tanker truck water and other things. So you know this is this is like your your question sort of opens up into a whole variety of different things, but it touches on the fact that there are many different ways that you could improve the efficiency of it. The idea of, of charging for water, involving the private sector, green fencing, are all ideas that in some cases may have merit, but they're not a panacea. Not without an effective oversight and regulation and thinking about how do you actually provide those services to everyone, because frankly there also are public health benefits to also providing them for everyone. And, and the other point that I was just going to add to that 
about the pan-sub, is that you know you actually do have you know a vibrant private sector if you think about it that way that's meeting the unmet demand by the municipality. And in many cases, as Shema said, people are actually paying for that water that are coming from the tanker truck. It's a, it's a sort of a fragmented system, but it's a private sector. It's a more DIY system or a more piecemeal system, but it's sort of where the private sector has stepped in to address sort of the public sector, not meeting that demand. Uh, could you elaborate why the United States and the UK abstain from the right um, for water and sanitation to be a basic human right? Yeah, so, <laughs> so I, I can't tell you 100% for sure, but I have sort of hypothesized based on a, a handful of different things. That So number one, they were part of the consensus. So I mentioned that there were two things, right? There was this General Assembly resolution and then the Human Rights Council um, resolution. They were part of the consensus, right? They didn't abstain or they sort of went along with the consensus when it went before the Human Rights Council. I think that when you look at actually the legal, the sort of the language that was put before the General Assembly, it was a right to water and sanitation actually sort of at, um, unattached to any of those legal documents that I mentioned. So it wasn't actually we're recognizing this right as emanating from this covenant. It was as if the language of it was a kind of new right. And on top of it, there was also these other concerns, I think, about privatization and about what, what does it mean to establish a right and are there, for example, transboundary obligations. Does water-rich Canada, for example, have to share its water with um, you know, some uh, Jordan, which doesn't have much water, right? Water, and when you look at what actually went before the Human Rights Council a couple of months later, it's a much more specific document. It's tied to that covenant. And it's expressly saying uh, that private sector, it doesn't use this exact language, but essentially says um, states have the obligation, but they can use whatever means they want to get there, i.e. private sector participation is allowed. So when you look at the reasons that the US and the UK and Canada are uh, abstaining, they're actually making, for the most part, procedural objections. What they're saying is, let's wait for the resolution, this process that's happening in Geneva. I mentioned that there was like a special rapporteur. Uh, let's wait for her to finish her work. And let's, uh, this is very premature and kind of came out of nowhere. And this is in some ways true because uh, apparently this resolution was introduced by Bolivia uh, with support of some countries, but caught a lot of people by surprise. And so my sense, my sort of hypothesis, reading all of these documents and sort of putting this all together was that um, there were these concerns about recognizing a right in the abstract that wasn't tied to any of these existing legal documents that may be interpreted in a way that, say, would be against privatization or would be uh, require these transboundary obligations. And so it was this kind of like, well, I don't know that we want to I don't know that we want to go with that because we don't know what this really means. And when it actually comes before the Human Rights Council, it's sort of couched in a way that they're like, okay, we recognize that this is where it's coming from, and by placing it within, tying it to that covenant that I was talking about, we understand too that it's neutral vis-a-vis -vis private sector participation. So I have a question which Perhaps it also relates to what, what you were saying in terms of what we uh, can understand either from Mumbai or maybe Delhi, and then take that a little bit further. Um, so I was thinking about this promise that was recently made by uh, this political party in Delhi about what, 700 liters of clean water per day per household. Right? So it's about 185 pounds. Uh, and of course, it relates to, I think, one question that, that you're asking, which is, are those household metered? Who gets those, those free water? And, and so on. And let's take the view, which is probably true, uh, that uh, this promise was made by uh, this new political party, the operating engines. So the question I have is, the front, uh, but 
before I even ask that, that question that we carry out by saying that I'm an engineer, so most of the things that you're talking about just, <laughs> I, I don't understand but I realize the value of that. So, uh, so having said that, so there is this, uh, let's say we have these, uh, these hero politicians. And I don't mean that in any, in any way, I mean maybe their aspirations are, are good and intentions are good. Or we have people who you know, actually want to do good. So there is this do good effect versus there are, uh, or not versus, there are these regulatory principles. Uh, in the context of water, how, uh, or in general, how do you balance those? So how do you channelize uh, this desire to do good with doing something that eventually turns out to be good? Can regulatory principles help? Is uh, 700 liters per day free to every household a solution? Yeah, I think that this is a, a big challenge, and it sounds like a very similar, I'm not familiar with the promise specifically, but it sounds very similar to the Sheep Center's promise of providing X number of free houses to residents. These promises work really well for rallying your political support, but they're impossible to implement. I mean, the idea that they would actually be able to fulfill that promise is such a well, pun intended pipe dream. That um, that it it would it actually does disservice to the residents, and I think that you know, and, and there are some you know very institutional mechanisms in place within the Indian Constitution, within the Indian government, to actually prevent against the politicization of some of these processes. A very deliberate separation between the bureaucracy, underpinned by um, the Indian civil, uh, administrative service, and um, the political wing, the deliberative branch of government. And the idea that um, that these basic services should be provided in a depoliticized context has, has has not worked to a certain degree, and that system needs to be revisited. But in the spirit of kind of thinking about, um, they can't be these one-off promises. There has to be a more sustained um, sort of uh, administrative infrastructure that's in place to be able to deliver them, or else they're going to be empty promises that you know. The voters will turn against that party in the time the next election comes around. It's 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 too disconnected from reality to actually have a have meaningful consequences beyond the sort of the next election. Yeah, and let me answer that by actually talking about South Africa, because I think that that's an interesting example that goes back to your question about people all of a sudden being metered for the first time. So um, South Africa there has a very progressive constitution that for for the most part. Uh, mirrors a lot of those rights that we were talking about in the covenant, but expressly has a right to water. And has, so this idea of everybody getting a certain minimum amount of water is known as a lifeline, uh, basically a lifeline policy where, and so South Africa had passed a law where they said, okay, every household is entitled to 6,000 kiloliters of water per month. So when you ran an average household, has I think four people, this is what they're sort of the numbers are for a month. Anyway, you break this down, and it, it's supposed to be around 25 liters per person per day. Well, it turned out that in uh, a lot of these, um, uh, in certain poorer communities, you had much larger households, and you often had multiple households that were connected to a tap. So the reality was is that people were not, uh, the 6,000 kiloliters per month wound up really running out somewhere mid-month. Mid now there was a history because under the apartheid regime, although conditions were terrible, people were getting used to sort of illegally tapping into the water and not paying for it. As kind of combined with this idea of, well, to the government was seeking partially to uh, recoup its financial, uh, to start charging for water, uh, and also saw had a campaign to try to conserve water. So for these low income communities, they actually installed taps that shut off uh, once the 6,000 kiloliters were uh, basically ran out and you needed to put money in in order to keep them going. Now mind you, think about it if you don't pay your water bill. What happens? It doesn't immediately shut up. You get notice. You usually could have a right to actually appeal it and there may be certain, so there's sort of a kind of due process that's put in place. And in fact, in the richer parts of um, Johannesburg and other parts, there were, uh, people had, they, they didn't have these automatic shut-ups. It was only in these particular poor communities. And something terrible happened. 
basically there was a fire and these young children uh, basically burned in this fire because the community, the sort of the local taps nearby, nobody had enough coins to actually put the water in. And so this basically caught people's, um, you know, it's in, it's in Soweto, and it caught people's um, attention and said, you know, this is a policy that is discriminatory and in many ways it doesn't resonate with this right to water uh, in our constitution. And so a legal case was brought. And, and what's interesting is to sort of see the interplay. Depending on what, what you, um, you know, people have differing views of how they think the courts rule. So the lower court takes a look at this policy uh, and says, um, this is clearly not enough water. That really 50, if you remember the WHO guidelines, 50 liters per person per day is really what is the minimum standard. And so we think that this, these uh, taps um, are not appropriate and people should get 50 liters of water per day. It goes up to the Court of Appeals. The Court of Appeals then intervenes and says, well, actually taking expert testimony, we think it's a lower amount of water. I can't remember, I think it was something like 43 or some, some other number that they said, no, this is the right amount, right? So when you think about What's the role of the judiciary versus the role of the legislature versus the role of the regulatory? You know, who should really be the one making those kinds of policies, right? And then it goes up to the Supreme Court. And what the Supreme Court does is it basically says, um, yes, we have a right to water, but we are not in the business of defining that minimum content. Uh, we think that there has been enough evidence put forward by the municipality that they are essentially trying to progressively realize this right and that they've sort of made these arguments about why um, they need to conserve water and that this seems to be the right amount and that you know there was this interesting sort of piece about well, the, that um, you know counsel for the plaintiffs uh, the, the people who lived in the settlements are complaining that the municipality keeps changing the record and they said well that's probably essentially a good thing because it means that they keep they keep supplementing the record well it's because they keep trying to make changes so ultimately the supreme court in south africa says um, yes we have this right but we're going to defer to the legislature the regulatory body that's in the better position to be assessing how much water and how that should be delivered right so when we think about, you know, the, the, the question then that you raise is political promises are easy to make. Delhi, unlike Mumbai, actually has serious water shortages and is looking over at Haryana's water and is eager to take some of that, right? Um, and, the, and that's a huge amount of water. As, and then there's a question of who's official, right? Who's actually being counted in that? And so I think that getting back to the question of, um, you ask sort of what, what, what principles do we use? In my mind, the value of talking about water as a human right is in some ways to give us a common parlance around saying, this is an ideal, this is sort of what dignity means, and here are some criteria that we can use that can provide guideposts for regulation. And it's a question about whether or not you think it's appropriate for courts to be in the business of actually putting the amount, you know, the number of leaders or whether or not that's actually better left to a regulatory agency that's in the better position. But I think that, um, you know, the, if you're making, you know, promises like that are unfortunately probably destined to not be kept. 